the video you're about to see is a reaction video. It is a video of opinion. Nothing personal is meant toward the individuals in the videos. My volition uh, for posting these reaction videos is to look at these videos and critique them through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Usually they are quantum grammar related videos and I'm looking for correct sentence structure knowledge here. And I'm also looking at the claims made in the videos through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Now you may notice that I'm doing certain things with my hands. I am not making any secret hand signs or gestures. When one is doing public speaking, there's only so many things you can do with your hands. You can fold them, maybe put them on your hips, dangling lifelessly at your sides, put them in your pockets, hold them like this, whatever it is. I'm not making any type of signaling gestures, unless I do this, which means shaka. Keep in mind the information, the things that I'm sharing in this video are for educational purposes only, entertainment purposes only, nothing personal towards the individuals in the videos themselves. Thanks and enjoy. Broadcast. This one I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to react to a video that really has nothing to do with quantum grammar. Nothing to do with correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. Um, but what it does have to do with is this individual right here whose name is Brian Parker. And he has been running a group called Tactical Sovereignty which has been on the internet for a few years. I actually was a part of the Facebook group in 2017, 2018, uh, when I first began studying correct sentence structure. And I just kind of observed the things that he was doing, he was teaching, showing people. And it has, a, what he does has a lot to do with, from my perception, a lot to do with common law and a lot of biblically related stuff. Uh, he draws a lot of what he talks about or follows from the Bible. Um, and I actually like listening to what he says, uh, his, his take on things, his view on views on things. It's very interesting looking at, you know, the fiction system from different angles one thing that kind of put me off from him though was the fact that anytime anyone brought up anything about quantum grammar in his tactical sovereignty group he would belittle them and be very dismissive of them and i couldn't figure out why and this was before i had closure on the grammar and then after i got closure on the grammar i began seeing him doing such things like he would comment on various quantum grammar related videos on YouTube and would be very condescending uh, in attitude towards people. Like he would purposely, from what I see, troll these quantum grammar videos. And I always wondered why. And then I realized why it was. is because he doesn't know quantum grammar. He, he doesn't know the first thing about it. He has no grasp of what it is or what it does. And that's usually the go-to for most people that don't know about something. And they can't grasp it or won't grasp it for whatever reason. They dismiss it out of hand then. They belittle it. Out of whatever, I don't know, fear, jealousy, who knows. Myself, I don't belittle others who use tactics or techniques that work. I'm a big fan of what works. I've always said that. I've always held that position. And if what he does works for him and works for other people and he helps people to navigate the fiction system and stay out of harm's way, well, blessings to them. I mean, more power to you. Whatever works for you. 
you know, what works for me is correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar. It has for the last five years without fail. Uh, but it takes a lot of effort and study to learn it, no doubt. But also, on the other hand, it takes a lot of effort and study to learn what he, what he knows and what he does. Um, and the difference between the two is everything that he does or promulgates is based on adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun, fiction, babble. Whether it's the Bible, whether it's common law, whatever it is, it's all babble. And he does go into language and talk about etymology of things, but he doesn't seem to, as I like to say, play the tape the whole way through. He doesn't go back to earliest nativity root meanings most times. And he certainly doesn't allow for or take into consideration the particles of negation in words. Sometimes he does, but it just depends upon what he's conveying, whether it's convenient to what he's trying to do or not, as to whether those things matter or not, just like the fiction system. But I do have a lot of uh, honor and respect for the guy, for the work he's put in and what he does. And I'm just here to look at uh, what he's saying in this particular video. It's about 10 minutes long. I don't, I, I've never watched it before, so I'm just going to sort of watch it and give some thoughts on it through the lens, of course, of correct sentence structure. Yeah, I was brought up in a Christian home. Um, I, w I would call it, it had the ideals of a, I would say, a Baptist home with the flavor of a Pentecostal home, maybe. And it, it was, you know, kind of a tight line to follow. And I was in Christian school all my life never spent a minute in public school and so I spent a lot of time memorizing different texts different scriptures uh, which even causes me to lend credence to things like the Mandela effect in fact because when we memorize scripture it wasn't just a matter of repeating it you actually had to write it down with the correct um, grammar vowel and punctuation all through it and have no more than three mistakes when you did it so yeah the, the scriptures we memorize memorize them very well but some of the things I brought up this evening in the conversation I, I have even found very kind of startling or interesting to myself this has nothing to do with the Mandela effect right I, that the way nobody gets twisted or gets thrown sideways here okay um, but I've studied Jewish culture, the Jewish people. All right, ladies and gentlemen, is it just me or is this man slurring his words? Now, this is no meant as no offense towards him personally. I mean, because he may have a speech impediment or so he may have been in an accident and, you know, and that has an effect on the way he, he talks. But it sounds like he's slurring his words. I've studied Hebrew, uh, learn how all these different things kind of operated within Scripture. And one of the most interesting things, especially with the Hebrew language, it, it's totally different than any other language. Because it, it's got three characteristics to it that other languages don't have. And, and that is that the Hebrew language doesn't use like letters for instance it uses more like what you would call symbols okay letters are symbols they're hieroglyphs it's all hieroglyphs whether it's a letter a symbol a drawing every alphabet is a hieroglyphic alphabet so in that sense Hebrew is not different than any other language because it still uses hieroglyphs symbols to represent whatever meaning it is sounds uh different meanings okay 
It might resemble a bowl, it might resemble a hand, things like that. Uh, the second characteristic is that each of those symbols has their own definition to them. Just like any other uh, language, if you look up and parse each letter or hieroglyph, it will give you an etymological continuance of the evidence to the earliest nativity root meaning of that letter, symbol, or hieroglyph. So again, that's really no different than any other uh, alphabet or language. And then third, each of those symbols also carries a numerical value, a number. That's well, in plain English, the alphabet, you can connect numbers to the letters, but I don't think that it's a given, like that that's the way it is. So if he's saying that Hebrew, that those letters or those symbols are associated with specific numbers, that that's the way the language works, then that is definitely a difference. And that gets into gematria, and I'm not going to be talking about that. This but it's interesting, like with the definitions of each different symbol, that you can go and look at different words. You can look at different names in Scripture. You can even go to your name. I, I've done it with my name. And gone and looked it up in Hebrew and looked at what each symbol stands for, what each definition is. And it, and it kind of gives you a little bit of a story. It tells you about what that man or woman is or whatever the object is that's being talked about. It gives you a more definitive idea as what the sentence is even all about. Whereas it doesn't matter whether it's English or Latin or French. I studied French in school. And none of those give you that kind of info. So the Hebrew language is very interesting in that aspect. And at the same time, you know, what we've been taught that the Old Testament of the Scripture was in Hebrew. And that the New Testament for Scripture was in Greek. I would probably argue against that, and I think there's more and more evidence coming out today showing that even the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew and then translated later into Greek. This Hebrew was the more original language of the people at that time. Uh, Greek was something that had kind of been thrust upon them with the different agencies coming in and conquering and taking over whether it was Rome, Augustus, where. But it's very particular looking at that language because you see so many people argue against the Bible being inherent, word of God, it can't be changed, yada, yada, yada. Listen, anytime a Hebrew text is taken and put into another language, translation, transliteration, whatever the case may be, it's going to lose those three original elements that I just covered. Without knowing Hebrew, I would say that the first two elements are pretty much irrelevant, but the third one that he's talking about as far as the gematria and the numbers, yes, that would definitely be lost. And when you translate from one language to another, yes, you lose uh, the author's original, some of the author's original volition when you make that translation. Unless you have the author there with you articulating those things to you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the Bible here. Okay. This man is obviously a believer of the Bible. Uh, he buys into it. I'll just tell you straight out that my position on the Bible is that it is the one of the greatest psycholog psychological operations ever perpetrated upon mankind. To get them to believe in something that they cannot prove or certify and get them to believe in that probably because of their fear of death. And then once you can do that, then you can get them to believe anything. 
and you can get them to commit atrocities. So all these years you've had all these people arguing about how the Bible should be interpreted. Like, what's the correct translation? What's the original language of the Bible? And arguing and spending millions upon millions of dollars on research because this is supposedly the word of a being that you can't even prove exists. Bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, it was written by man. And it controls a lot of people's lives. And it's an authoritarian structure. And most, you could probably trace most of the wars and most of the violence and atrocities on the earth throughout history back to the Bible, religion, the Koran, and things like that. Which is why I say, again, it's one of the greatest psyops ever perpetrated upon mankind. And the fact that someone as intelligent, obviously intelligent as, as this man, buy into it, is proof of that. But that's just my personal position. If you, the viewer, believe in the Bible and that is a, a core element of your everyday life, that's... <laughs> That's your choice. You know, it's definitely not something that I buy into, though. I did my seven years in Catholic school, my Bible study, going to church five days a week, every day of the school year, Monday through Friday, and uh, studying the Bible. And outside of that, even in my adult life, I studied the Bible and the Koran and lost books of the Bible and the... Nag Hammadi scrolls and the Dead Sea scrolls and the Forgotten Books of Eden and whatever else you can find, the Gospel of Q, any book that was associated with the Bible, I've probably read it. And that's how I've come to my conclusion. And I have that. I have correct set structure to thank for that because I only participate with things that can be certified as facts. I definitely don't buy into things that I can't prove. But I won't hold it against anybody if they do. I'm just giving you my own personal position on it and reacting to what uh, Brian's saying here. It's no way to transfer them. It's not possible. Which means you're also going to lose what that verse means, what that sentence means, what that chapter or book even means. You're going to lose those basic elements. That's another thing that I find with people who are staunch zealots in adherence to a religion or a certain edition of the Bible is that they always feel that everyone else's Bible is wrong, that only they have the correct Bible and that their Bible tells the real truth talks about the real Jesus and everyone else is wrong if it doesn't line up with what they think which is just kind of uh, kind of humorous to me looking at a situation where a couple was looking to emigrate back to I would say back to Israel uh, under the right of return law because Israel has a right of return law where, and I will post something down in the comments below or in the description box rather, give you a better idea of it. But it, basically where if you have relatives or family originally from Israel, you have the right of return. And when I was looking at their case and looking at their situation, uh, there was something that... I wonder if that right of return, people who decide to exercise that right, I wonder if those people, when they go over to claim their land or they, or they get put deposited into a location in Israel, if they're kicking out a Palestinian to move the right of return people into the old Palestinian lands, kind of like they did to the First Nations here in North America, uh, the white, uh, well, 
not necessarily white, but the, the Europeans and the English, they pushed out the First Nations and settled, settled here in North America, just like right now as we speak. The Israelis are literally displacing Palestinians, kicking them out by force out of their homes, claiming, I guess, this ludicrous right of return, again, coming from the Bible, coming from the Torah, coming from religion, committing atrocities on other races and other peoples because they feel they have the right because of some imaginary friend. It just kind of jumped off the page at me. And, and something that the Christian church needs to pay attention to today. Because like I said, I, I grew up in the Christian church. Um, I, I knew the term, you know, pray for Zion. Uh, you know, our heart needs to be with Israel. We need to donate to Israel, all of those things. And, and I'm not going to get into the different aspects regarding banking and what, what's really happening, what's really occurred with that uh, since the late 1940s. Because a lot of stuff happened in the late 1940s, whether people realize it or not. My guess is he's talking about what happened after World War II. Well, I'm a shock. If Jesus, or as the Apostle Paul called him, the Christ Jesus, was to be walking amongst us today and want to do a right of return to Israel and gain citizenship, what do you think would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. No, no, no. No soup for you. He wouldn't be allowed. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, would not be allowed to reside permanently and have citizenship in Israel. And the reason why is because he had been baptized into a different faith. He was baptized by John the Baptist. That's when the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Because that story I was reading of this other couple, that's exactly what happened to them. They were denied citizenship because they had previously been baptized. Which isn't part of the culture of today's state of Israel or nation of Israel or whatever you want to call it. To me, that's just something very interesting to think about, to stop and consider. That if the Jesus of today's churchianity or Christian faith or whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Luther, oh, it doesn't matter. If that Jesus was here today, and was seeking refuge or citizenship in the state of Israel, by law, he would be denied. So the question on the thumbnail is, you know, Jesus knocking, can he come in legally? The answer to that question is no. Stop and think about who you're serving. Pay close attention. So to wrap this up, this uh, video was basically discussing the Hebrew language, Israel, how the Bible has been modified, being that it began with the language of modification, adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun. A Babel language and then was further modified and changed into other languages telling stories that were basically lifted from older religions and older cultural stories from other countries and cultures and people 
would this imaginary hypothetical character Jesus be legally allowed to enter this place called Israel that prior to World War II did not exist legally. So if this hypothetical Jesus tried to enter Israel before World War II, there wouldn't have been an Israel to enter. He'd have been entering Palestine. And he probably would have no problem going anywhere he wanted to over there. But this is all imaginary. He said, she said, there is no way to really certify any of this. It's just interesting thing to discuss, talk about if you're interested in religion and history. Uh, these things are just, uh, you know, something to talk about at the water cooler. But to get back to the domain of fact, if you would like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, which has absolutely nothing to do with the video you just watched, then contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen, or you can watch this channel with over 400 free videos on it, which also offers memberships. You can click the join button to find out about that. And until the next video, Hope everybody stays safe and healthy. Goodbye for now.